You're a mountain biker looking for a simplified approach to training specifically for your sport. Well, you're in the right place because in this video, I'm going to help you identify the five key physical attributes you need to become a better rider, but most importantly, how to train to improve them. I'm Johnny Thompson from Fit for Racing and I'm a performance coach to some of the best mountain bikers in the world. I'm here to share my knowledge with you and hopefully get you to ride better and be a more holistic athlete. But before we delve into this video, it's about the right time you skipped it all together and visited fitforracing.com where you can sign up to a program specifically for your discipline, enduro, downhill, or if you're training at home, we also have a program for that. Links to those programs are in the description below. Pick the one that's most suitable to you. You don't have to be a pro rider to benefit from our experience. Stop the guesswork and start training properly so that next season you are unbeatable. Oh, you're still here. I take it you wanna see the rest of the video where we're gonna coach you through the five general physical skills of mountain bikers. Okay. Before we start though, it's important to note that this isn't just for professional riders. The importance of knowing these five skills is so that you can identify the one you're weakest at. Because more often than not, the one that you're worst at is the one that really holds you back. We have a tendency to train the things that we like and that we're good at, but ultimately to be better, you need to identify the things that you're worst at the weakest link in the chain so that then you can bring it up to speed and be a more holistic and better rider. It's worth noting that this isn't necessarily a skills acquisition on bike training video. It is strength and conditioning specific, but there are some techniques to learn on the bike that will help your fitness. So without further ado, let's get into the first physical skill. Number one on the list is cardiovascular endurance, but this is not just cardiovascular endurance, it's stamina as well. You might separate these in a sports science textbook, but for the purposes of training, they aren't that far different. Cardiovascular endurance is simply the gathering and delivering of oxygen or your ability to, and stamina, pretty much the same, but for energy within your muscles. So let's take a look at these two together and why you need to focus on it to be a better rider. You don't have to be an XC competitor or ultra endurance rider to give a shit about stamina and endurance. Because ultimately, we all ride for long days and towards the end, your ability to sustain that effort basically determines whether you have a good or bad ride. So even if you're doing uplifts, if you could do 12 instead of eight because of your ability to sustain that effort, then that's a better day because you've got a third more runs in. So it's not necessarily for the endurance athlete that these are important, but more for general riders that actually want to enjoy the whole ride or longer on multiple days. By having better endurance and stamina, you'll actually have better reserves of the energy systems that help for the power for downhill. So those people with a better foundation of cardiovascular ability can get to the top of a hill and have more in reserve to then call upon when times are more demanding and intense on the fun stuff. To improve your base cardio and stamina it comes down to simply time. The most effective way we understand is zone two training, long, slow efforts at a sub-maximal heart rate. Zone two might be a lot lower than you normally ride on a weekend fire road. So training that on an indoor trainer can be a more controlled environment so that you're in the optimum zone. I mean, it's pretty boring, but the more time you can spend in a zone two throughout the week, the more benefits you get. And it doesn't necessarily beat you up like other types of training. So you can improve by adding volume over time in a linear progression of volume added. It is possible to spice things up with functional training in a zone two environment where you reduce the intensity 
and the load so that then ultimately you're getting more physical benefits to than just sitting on a bike because ultimately if you're sitting on a bike all day and training on it all day then your hip flexors get tight it's not great for your lower back and hip health and then when you have a crash that's the first time in a long time that you've been in an extreme position so by hopping off the bike say on a 60 minute zone two Hopping off the bike, doing 15 squats, 10 push-ups, maybe pull-ups or ring rows, getting back onto the bike and paying attention to your heart rate, still being in zone two. That's gonna be better for you being a mountain bike athlete than a road cyclist when we're training that endurance. It's important though that with any linear training, adding volume, if you hit a plateau, that means you're not gonna continue at the same rate of increase without taking some deload or reload time. So taking a week, week off, reducing the volume to 40 to 60%, and then adding on again the following week may well get you out of that hole and keep you progressing. Looking at me, boy, you're yeah, looking at me, girl. You're yeah, looking at me, keeping that love, but you're looking at me. Number two, functional strength. This is a buzzword in the fitness industry, but we are separating absolute strength to functional strength because strength for a mountain biker may look a little different to a power lifter. So mountain biking functional strength basically means that you are applying or resisting force in a real world environment so that you can cope with the situational variables of mountain biking. So G outs, berm corners, compressions, and holding position, optimal positions throughout the day's riding. That all demands functional strength. And strength training can be very complicated. If you start Googling strength training, there's all kinds of programs out there that are the best. But ultimately, for mountain biking, you might just need a base strength, which, in my opinion, the more simple, the better. So squat, deadlift, press, and isometric core movements like bird dog plank and side plank. If you use a progressive overload, so three weeks of doing more weight, then having a deload week and keep doing that, you will make amazing progression without necessarily having to make things complicated. In your first few months of training, you can get really, really good progress. And the more simple, the better, because as soon as you start making things complicated, you're using up those credits for when you start plateauing, which will eventually happen. The longer you train, the more your body gets used to it and the more stimulation it needs from variation. So that's when we get more complicated training programs so then we get the body to make change by tricking it into stimulation that it's not felt before. But for the early stages, a progressive overload, adding weight or, and or reps over time, and then taking time off when you plateau to then restart again, this is the most optimal way to build strength, absolute strength. And that base strength will then help you riding. It's only when you max out the simplicity that you might also want to look at sports specific strength in funky movements or complicated training patterns. But I'd suggest that you leave that until you've got the basics done well. Once you're keen to mix things up, then it's time to sign up for Fit for Racing where we do all of the science behind the scenes so you don't have to think about it whatsoever and you know that every training session contributes to your ability on the bike. Again, the links are in the description below. Sign up today. On to physical attribute number three. We're banding together speed and power into a continuum because ultimately, like stamina and endurance, they're trained in a very similar way. Power being the ability to move large loads quickly, large loads being external objects generally, and speed being 
pretty much your ability to move yourself quickly. So the continuum goes higher loads, lower speed, but maximal effort, all the way down to zero load, ultra speed. So in between that is the loading and the speed, with the key point being that it's maximal effort to get the most muscle recruitment at every stage being heavy or light. Power and speed are synonymous with cycling sports, but for mountain biking specifically, it goes beyond just pedal power. Obviously, there are benefits on the trail or in a race environment when putting some pedal cranks in. The higher the power, the quicker your acceleration over that short amount of time that you can do that. So you can clear features more easily or pick up time if you're racing. But also, power can be in the posterior chain for extension, for things like bunny hops or other feature clearing skills, and upper body for gene out, pushing, and controlling your bike. So it's not just pedal power that we're looking at here, but speed and power for real world mountain bikers. Training for power then, so power at the heavy end, starts at about 70% of your maximal absolute strength. And then you're going to try and push that weight faster, as fast as you can on every single rep. This base heavy power can be done with Olympic lifts. However, the time it might take to learn those and do them safely and effectively might not be that efficient. So instead, you can substitute the Olympic lifts as the weight gets lighter and the speed gets more by things like banded squats and deadlifts and even banded bench press. So using bands encourages more speed, more power to then get more muscle recruitment, which is the ultimate goal of this type of training. And by training this way, it builds neuromuscular connections, basically your brain's connection to your muscle to tell it to fire more. So you don't have to necessarily do a hypertrophy muscle building phase to get more strength, power, and speed in your muscles because it's simply your ability to connect your brain to tell your muscle what to do. There are benefits of training each end of the spectrum and everything in between depending on if you're a seasonal athlete or general physical prepared athlete, then take a consideration of both and when you might want to add those into a seasonal approach. So like Fit for Racing, we do a loose seasonal approach, Northern and Southern Hemisphere racing, where we'll start with absolute strength, moving to power and then speed before the start of the season. But we have some general physical preparedness elements in there so that never any point during the program you'll feel unfit. Number four is mobility. It's important to understand this isn't flexibility. Mobility being your ability to apply force or resist it at end range, whereas flexibility is simply just getting as far as you can. So that might not necessarily be that functional. So mobility for mountain bikers, it might not seem that obvious of the benefits, but the biggest one for me is injury prevention. Not just when you have a crash and you're able to maneuver into different positions and not snap your shit up every time, but also having healthy, mobile hips, upper back, shoulders, that will stave off any niggles. And if you do get a niggle of your time of riding because of things like tight hip flexors, that niggle then can cause discomfort, which is never good on a ride. But also, that niggle can eventually mean time off the bike. So as a performance enhancing area to identify, if your mobility is poor, you may be in the danger zone. And ultimately, the worst thing for bike performance is time off the bike. So look after yourself with mobility to get more time and pain-free time on the bike.
And the final of our five is agility, which is your ability to change from one movement pattern to another quickly. Being agile is important for most people that want to be more athletic, but for mountain bikers specifically, being agile on your bike makes the difference between riding stiff and riding like a pro, which we all want to do. But there are many benefits to being agile, and what we've talked about before, lots of those elements actually help you become more agile. But what we wanna do now is when we're looking at agility is look at the sports specific nature of what we want to improve. So things like changing direction quickly in the upper body, which will reflect your ability on the bars, or being able to hop off your bike and land on your feet uh, in any kind of crash scenario. That's always gonna help being able to tuck and roll and be actually functional in your own being with dynamic movement training, speed and change of direction. Hopefully during this video, I've helped you identify weak areas that might be holding you back and an indication of how to train to bring them up. But it's really worth noting that for a mountain biker, it's not worth just focusing on strength or just focusing on speed and power. You really need to have an holistic approach to your training that incorporates a little bit of everything. But if you do have a weak area, it's worth spending more time on that to bring it up to speed, quite literally, with the other areas. That is the key to becoming a better rider. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Sign up and get the notification bell clicked so that you can be informed of any other videos that we'll do probably next week. Uh, and you can be the first to see it. If you liked it, leave a comment below. That always helps us. And I'd like to see what your opinion is of this subject specifically. Until next time, peace.